So, with 2017 coming to a close, or just a little bit away from the turn of the calendar to the new year, we start to take a look back at the best performers of the year, the best matches of the year, and so on and so forth. And for today, the fifth day, belated fifth day, mind you, but the fifth day of OTRS Central Christmas, I'm going to take a look back at my five favorite matches of 2017. Now, usually this is the type of thing that fits into a top 10 or top 15, top 25, depending on how much wrestling you watch and how deep you go. Well, the truth is that I didn't go that deep into wrestling this year, so I was lucky to get to five. But five it is, and five favorite matches of mine. It does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that they are the five best matches of the year. That does not mean they have to be your five favorite matches of the year, because honestly... I don't care if they were or not. It is just simply about what my five favorite matches were for the year. And these had to be matches that I actually watched. So some of you are going to bring up Dunn versus Brait for the European Championship. Or what was it? The UK Championship. Excuse me. Whatever the hell. Who cares? Point is, is I didn't watch that match. So I didn't really have any designs on watching it. Didn't really care to. Um, so it probably was a really good match. I'm sure a lot of you have geeked out to it, and that's fine. But in order for it to possibly have been a favorite of mine, I had to watch it. So, in a, in a year filled with a lot of negativity, I'm trying to cleanse the palate with some positivity as we turn to 2018, where we'll probably be back down a little bit of a negative path. Uh, so let's go. Five favorite matches of 2017. Number five. Oh, I love this match. This was so awesome. Jeremy Borash and Joseph Park versus Josh Matthews and Scott Steiner at Slammiversary 15. This match was freaking hilarious. It's like they took some of the good things that TNA used to do in terms of crazy stuff. They took some of the elements from what the Hardys did with the total deletion things, and they incorporated it here. You know, cameos with Father James Mitchell and Shark Boy and all of that. This match was awesome. Steiner and Matthews driving on the golf cart with all that crap in their face. Like, how could you not like this match? I don't really know. But again, I don't really care because I absolutely loved it. And it's why Slammiversary was one of my sneaky surprise shows of the year in terms of enjoying it way more than I thought I was actually going to. And this match was awesome. I had so much fun watching it. You know, and I, I love big, serious fights. I love matches that really flow well together. I love matches that tell an incredible story. And every once in a while, it's nice just to have something different, something that just kind of breaks the mold a little bit. And this one most certainly did for me. I absolutely loved it. So I wanted to make sure it made it on the list, at least at number five. It made it over a recent edition, which would have been Aleister Black versus The Velveteen Dream at NXT TakeOver War Games. That almost made it on the top five. Could have made it on the top five, because while the action wasn't the crispest, the way the characters worked, the way the story progressed throughout the match, it was some, something for somebody like me who does not watch NXT. I was able to get it, I was able to grasp it, I was able to understand it, follow it, and I absolutely loved it. So I'm going to make sure I called out that match, but it wasn't as good to me as Borash and Park versus Matthews and Steiner at Slammiversary 15. That match had too much going for it, too many other things, even though there were absolutely no consequences to the match whatsoever. Uh, number four, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg for the Universal title at WrestleMania 33. This was an incredibly pleasant surprise. After the minute 26 second squash by Goldberg of Lesnar at Survivor Series and then him eliminating him at the Royal Rumble, you really worry about how is this match going to go off at WrestleMania? Are you going to be able to get 10 minutes out of him? Well, no, and you didn't need to. Just because a match can go longer... Does it mean it needs to go longer? Does it mean it should go longer? This match for the 4 minutes, 45 seconds, or 5 minutes that it went was kick-ass, balls to the walls from beginning to end. And in a business now where so many of these matches go 20, 25, 30, 35 minutes, and frankly a lot of times there's not enough depth of character there, there's not enough story there, there's not enough interest there to necessitate having a match that long, a five-minute world title match where everybody gets all their shit in and it's awesome and it flows so crisply. You don't worry about rest holds. You don't worry about any of that other crap. It's absolutely awesome. I enjoyed Goldberg's short run from Survivor Series to WrestleMania. I really, really did. 
and why I wasn't even that mad when I knew it was ultimately going to result in Lesnar winning the title. Because this match was awesome, and I felt like it was really the cap on some of the best business Brock Lesnar has ever done with the WWE, whether that was his first run in 2002 to 2004, or the current run from 2012 to present. I thought this was as good a business as he has done throughout his entire career. It was just awesome, and I absolutely loved this match. Number three, while the pay-per-view name was stupid and borderline infringing on copyrights of Jerry Lee Lewis's estate, Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman in the ambulance match at Great Balls of Fire was incredible. Again, another one of these things where it was just two guys kicking ass and doing all types of crazy shit, and it worked because the characters were developed enough, and the story, most importantly, was developed enough to where you weren't just randomly having an ambulance match. You were at that point in time where you needed some type of cap on it, like an ambulance match, and everything fed off of it, and everything made so much sense. I mean, for a pay-per-view where uh, Brock Lesnar versus Samoa Joe was kind of a disappointment, Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman was everything that was awesome on that night. That match kicked ass on so many different levels. And if I could get a few more matches like this one, a few more matches like Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg, I would be a very, very, very happy wrestling fan in comparison to what I've been the past couple of years. Reigns, Strowman, to me, easily the feud of 2017, at least in WWE, and I really don't see how anything else comes close. I really, really don't. And Braun's character, Braun Strowman himself, have to be incredibly thankful that he got so over because of Roman Reigns, and don't get it twisted, that's why he did. Fans didn't want to get behind Roman Reigns, so as a result, they got behind Braun Strowman, and Roman Reigns made Braun a star, and that's a fact, Jack. Not a superstar, but a star. At least made him a top guy. Put him into that conversation. To where we were talking about at SummerSlam, it should be Braun's time. You need to strike while the iron is hot. You need to go there and you need to go there now before it's too late. Great match. Great match. And kind of like that perfect you know, cap almost on their story. Uh, number two. I know some of you will be like, shame on me. But it is what it is. Tomohiro Ishii versus Tetsuya Naito. I hope I said both of their names right. But that night one G1 USA Climax special, whatever the hell it was called, I loved this freaking match. I know some people will point to like Ishii versus Omega. This was the match for me. This was the match that I absolutely loved. I thought this match was awesome. I thought it did so many different things that it needed to do. And ultimately, for somebody who didn't know most of these guys from a hole in the damn ground, it got me really marking for Ishii and made me a mark for him. I mean, again, with no real reason. I mean, to me, that's when I feel like a match is great. Is when I can sit there as definitely, you would say, a very, 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 very casual viewer of New Japan. Doesn't really care about the product, doesn't follow it, doesn't do any of that. You can take me in one match, in a 15-minute match, and make me a fan of somebody. That's when you know you've done something. That's when you know you've got me. And they got me with this match. Absolutely loved it. They told the story. They sold when they needed to. Ishii also demonstrated how you know sell, and that in a way is a sell. That is in a way working. It was just absolutely incredible. I loved the freaking match. I thought it was the best match of those two nights of G1. I really, really did. Um, so, yes, unfortunately for some of you that usually like when I crap on New Japan, I'll reserve that to the Young Bucks pretty much all the time and Kenny Omega some of the time, but not all the time. Um, but not this match. I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due, and credit was most certainly due here. So, you know, I think back on those matches, I don't know if they are like instant classics necessarily, but they were my favorites. But none of them could stack up to number one. And you ought to know what number one is. When you talk about politics, when you talk about positioning, when you talk about ensuring multiple potential WrestleMania big money seven figure payout matches when you talk about breakfast club business you're talking about the Raw versus Smackdown five on five traditional tag match at Survivor Series 2017 like you had to know this had to be my favorite of favorites for the entire year if for no other reason it's going to give me months of material leading up to WrestleMania like again for those that foolishly pray to the man up above 
that they've never seen, that they're not even sure exists, that allows so many bad things to happen in the world. I choose to believe in a God that I can actually see. It's like when Joel Carlin, or George Carlin excuse me, said that he believed in Joe Pesci because he saw it. He believed in him, and he figured he had the same success rate when he prayed to him as when he did to the guy above. It makes sense to me, but at least with God, I can see miracles. I can see Hunter and the majesty of what he can do to be able to get himself in a position where he sets up a future match potentially with Jason Jordan, potentially with Kurt Angle, potentially with Shane McMahon, and then to top it all off with Braun Strowman. I mean, the fact that when all is said and done, Triple H is the one that seals the deal for his team, Triple H, the 48-year-old or so COO of the company, can sit there and have a big four pay-per-view in 2017, be all about him and close out and be still all about him, that is magnificence. That is incredible. That is a chaperone of legendary behavior of the highest order. These are the type of politics that I pray for. This is the type of backstage maneuvering and positioning that I dream to think of and talk about. And to sit there and see the big schnoz God himself, somebody again that I can see, that I can believe in because I know he's real, because I see the wonder of his work every single time he is on television, easily, easily. The number one favorite match of mine in 2017. Ugh. But I'm curious, what were your five favorite matches of 2017? What do you think about my list? Not that I necessarily care all that much, because you're most certainly not changing my number one. And for the sake of this channel, we shouldn't change the number one, because the number one was freaking incredible, hence why it was number one. Number one for a reason. But anyways, that's my five favorite matches of 2017. And this has been the fifth day of OTRS Central Christmas. Remember, OTRS Central, not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Tune in again next time for the fourth day of OTRS Central Christmas, where we talk about the WWE's new Fortunate Four. Oh, boy.